Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hello, Martin. Are you doing okay? I don't know. You'll have to inform me. Well, you look okay, so well, I'll then go that's by fine. the looks. <laughs> then that's fine. <laughs> We've had a question. A f uh, well, actually not one. A few people have asked us to give an overview of the great controversy. So today, let's take some time and discuss the in great a controversy. nutshell the great controversy. How much time do you have, Martin? Well, <laughs> the book, The Great Controversy, will probably take you a good few weeks or months to <laughs> read. So I hope not. We don't mine. have that. No, we don't have that. We have to, in a short time, get to the basics of what other people have studied for a lifetime. Yes, and the whole controversy has been for ages. And it is hotting up. Great. It is reaching a climax. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you very much for all the opportunities that you give us to have these discussions. We ask that you bless us, you enlighten our minds, and in this important topic that you will help us to discuss it, to give a good overview of what's going on. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Martin, how many millions of people have spent lifetimes studying this topic? Many, many millions. How many lives have been lost in the process? Yeah. Since the beginning of the world. All right. So if you take the Garden of Eden, Martin, mm. two brothers, and uh, <laughs> what started in heaven yeah. continued down here, and brother against brother, sister against sister, War, hatred, death, suffering. It's been a terrible, terrible catastrophe. This is the question that people have. Was it necessary for God to allow so much suffering? I mean, it is in his mm. power just to end it, right? Yes. He could have nipped it in the bud. Yes, with Lucifer already. All right. So why did he allow this catastrophe to continue and why the accompanying human woe mm. why the tears that are associated with it so to give an overview of the great controversy is not an easy task no. uh, is God arbitrary does he make arbitrary decisions or is he a God of meticulous order? Is he a God of compassion? Or is he a tyrant? Yeah. And we've discussed this in lecture after lecture after lecture. Some people have this tyrannical view of God. And some religious systems have this kingly hierarchical view of God. Calvin had that. Yeah. And Wesley had uh, this loving view of God. And these ideas have been clashing with each other for centuries. Mm. And those that sit on opposite sides of their view mm -hmm. clash with each other to the point where millions and millions of people are murdered and martyred yeah. because they don't see it exactly as you see it. It's actually sad. Yes. That you can go so far on your opinion to take the life of somebody else. All right, so let's start with this very basic question. Uh, is the jury still in session mm -hmm. when it comes to the character of God? Yes. Hmm? Yes. All right. Are there whole religious systems that claim that their view of deity is the correct one and everyone else must be killed by the sword if they don't follow that view. Yes. All right. And then you have the aggressive and you have the timid and you have everything in between. Mm -hmm. Right. With that as a basic, let's start with 
the biblical story. Mm. And you know, when you start with the biblical story, you pick up the Bible. Correct. Isn't that correct? Nothing else. Yes. You start with the Bible. Correct. Now, you can start in the book of Genesis, but then you won't get a view of, of the exact character of things. That comes a little bit later in the Bible. Mm. So one should actually go to Ezekiel chapter 28. And it says here in chapter 28, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. Thus says the Lord God. Now it's talking about the prince of Tyrus here. Mm. But we will soon see that the, the prince of Tyrus cannot conform to all the criteria yes. that are mentioned over here. So he's used as an acronym mm -hmm. for someone else. In other words, this is a typological story which finds a literal fulfillment and enactment in an earthly situation, mm. but has a deeper meaning. meaning. So this is the story of Lucifer. Thus says the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up. Mm. Point number one. He is someone who has lifted himself up, who is arrogant, right? Correct. Assumes a position that is not his, right? Yes. And thou hast said, I am a God. In my Bible here, which is the King James, it's written in a capital G. Mm. So here's a, an individual who is arrogant and claims to be a God. Not only that, I sit in the seat of God. He takes the throne. Yes. In his mind, at least, mm -hmm. he takes the throne. In the midst of the seas. In other words, all the created beings, the nations, the peoples, the multitudes. And then it says, yet thou art a man and not God. I said, thine heart has a heart of God. It's just in your nature mm. to elevate yourself. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Now, that is really something. Uh, Solomon was a very wise king, right? Yes. But Daniel was also given wisdom and understanding. Yes. And the Bible is very clear in the book of Daniel that Daniel had wisdom and understanding. There's no secret they can hide from thee. So, he's very intelligent. Mm -hmm. He has understanding. He has a character which is problematic. Mm. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten the riches and has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. So he has enriched himself. Mm. And this, this is a reference to an earthly king, yes. but referring to a higher power. Now, this attitude is something that prevails in humanity Correct. to this very day. Yes. So somewhere on the th in this world, you might have a prince, or maybe more, that have the same characteristics. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very, very rich, and they're constantly concerned with the poor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But thy great wisdom, and by thy traffic, hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Now this traffic is merchandise. So he's a merchant. Mm -hmm. And the Bible in other places tells us what his merchandise is. Yeah. It's gold and it's silver yeah. and it's all the, the spices and everything and the souls of men. And the, the, exactly. Right? Therefore thus says the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, Therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, 
and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and not a God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the death of the uncircumcised. Did you see that that is plural, Martin? Yeah. It's interesting, eh? Yes. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken it, says the Lord God. Mm. So it's a reference to the second death there. Yes. And uh, it's talking about the earthly tire, king mm -hmm. or prince. But of course, it also talks about the other one. Now, let's have a look at his attributes. We read them from verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, Martin, the cat's out of the bag, right? Correct. It cannot be the literal king of Tyre. No. Our prince of Tyre. So he's not just an ordinary cherub, he's a covering cherub. Now there were two cherubs mm. that covered the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. So in other words, this cherub was one that had a view, the closest view of the character and the law of God. Yes. And yet, he acted contrary to that law by coveting the position of God. You shall have no other gods besides me, right? Yes. And then it says, Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So this cannot be an earthly king. No. No. He walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now someone in the Bible that walks up and down is someone who claims ownership. Correct. Right? Yeah. So if you bought a piece of land, mm -hmm. you would take your shoe off and hand it over before witnesses and give it to the person that bought the land, put that shoe on, and then you walked up and down the land. That was the deal. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now that is a very profound statement. Perfect. perfect. That means without sin. Mm -hmm. From the day that thou wast created. So he's a created being. Yes. And he's not God, right? No. Nope. Till iniquity was found in thee. And this debate has been raging for millennia. Who put the iniquity there? Mm. Yes. Was it? According to this text, nobody put it there. It was found in him. Mm. Then the question arises, well, if God created him and it was found in him, then God must have put it there, right? That's the, That's the debate in Calvinism. <laughs> and uh, who's responsible for the fall? Did God create man to fall? Did he create Lucifer in order to be found with iniquity? Or what is this mysterious thing that happened here? This strange thing that interfered with perfection. So what was it? And how did it get there? Now, the first question I would have for you, Martin, is was this entity, Lucifer, was he capable of exercising his will? Yes. He proved it, right? Correct. Was he mm -hmm. capable of exercising that will contrary to the will of God? Yes. He proved it, right? Yes. Doesn't that prove that he has freedom of choice? Yes, 100%. Okay, so I had freedom of choice. Yes. Now, if he had freedom of choice and he was perfect, 
then he was without sin, right? Mm -hmm. He was perfect until. That word until implies a time period. Yeah. Until iniquity was found in him. So the iniquity, was it placed there by God or did it arise when he started exercising his will contrary to the will of God? Yes, that's when he started exercising his will contrary to the will of God. It was uh -huh. always there. But so God never he started exercising it. God never created it. No. But we can say that God created the potential yes. for it to develop. Yes. Because of free will. All right. So we have now come to the conclusion that God did not create the iniquity. It was found in him. Correct. But God created the potential for the iniquity. Yes. Okay. Now, was that a clever act or a stupid act? I understand your question because if you, it depends on how you look at this now and what your view of God is. Because if you've got a loving view of God, you'll know that this is not the issue. He definitely would have created. It was a good idea. Now, Martin, if he created the potential, knowing full well if he is an all-knowing God, that it would lead eventually to this catastrophe because this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the great controversy and overview. You have to have a beginning and you have to have an end, right? Yes. And you have to have, unfortunately, an in-between. Correct. If he knew this and he did it anyway, created that being with that potential, mm -hmm. then it must have been a very important point to him. Definitely, because that would prove something to him. So this freedom of choice that he instilled in this created being was of such paramount importance to God that he was prepared to suffer the consequences for a particular period of time. Yes. And he was not a God who was not going to become involved in this. No. He was prepared to bear the consequences himself. Yes. Right? Now, there are a couple of attributes here, and we read them down to verse 20, uh, that, that flow out of, this, out of this desire to elevate yourself. Mm. Constantly when you read the Bible the Lord warns against lording it over others. Mm -hmm. It shall not be so with you, right? Yes. The kings of this world, mm -hmm. they lord it over others. They command, yeah. it shall not be so without you. Is there a tendency in, in people to, to lord it over others? Oh, definitely. Hmm? Oh, definitely. And in some more so than others, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And has the world seen its fair share of tyrants? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I think the world is quite f tired of tyrants at this stage. Uh, well, how many tyrants does it take to convince humanity yeah. <laughs> that this elevated view? That's why I wanted to say, well, because you won't say that the world is tired of it by the way it's carrying on. No. It continually... Get somebody to be a tyrant over them. Correct. We had, a, we had a discussion just the other day in one of our talks here where we put Pope Benedict up there mm. and he was talking about his elevated view yeah. and why he has the authority, the mm. moral authority to do this, that and the other, to dictate not only in terms of theology but also in terms of politics. Correct. Look at these attributes here. By the multitude of thy merchandise, and we've already discussed that merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now, 
this is a very, very direct statement as to what the consequences eventually will be for this attitude. Yeah. But there are rock songs which are called Sympathy with the Devil. Mm. And if you read all the occultists throughout history, mm. where did their sympathy lie? With him. With him. It's just amazing, isn't it? So here it says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And thou hast cor corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now, here's a description of this being. Mm. Uh, does does this line up with the with the image like Baphomet, for example? <laughs> no, uh? not at all. No. So, if you have constantly depicted yourself or this being in this evil way, mm. and then one day this being of majestic beauty and brightness appears, wouldn't that floor some people? Yes, definitely. He's a master of reversal, isn't he? Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. Martin, he's talking about churches. Mm. And it's talking about thy sanctuaries, his sanctuaries. Does he control many religious systems in the world, according to this? Yes. Okay. By the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and I shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee. What is the, the basic uh, theology in the world about the survival of this evil being? Is he going to be destroyed like this, or will he have eternal life in a, in a fiery pool? He'll be actually ruling the f everlasting fire. So Martin, don't you find it amazing that the world has managed to distort this teaching beyond recognition? Yes. Into the exact opposite of what it says? Mm -hmm. He is the master of reversal, Definitely. right? Okay, so we're not going to continue there, but we can go to Isaiah chapter 14. We're just laying some groundwork about the character of the great adversary where the story is actually unfolded in a slightly different fashion. If we read from verse 11, which deals with this entity, mm. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. This is this final destruction. And then it gives this description. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? And I, you know, when I read that, Albert Pike comes to mind, mm -hmm. the grand master of Freemasonry, Lucifer. <laughs> yeah. And he says, strange that this being of light should be called the being of darkness. Is it he that bears the light? Doubt it not. Twisting it around, right? Completely the opposite. Completely the opposite. Master of reversal again. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Talking about the angels. Mm. And here you have this, this parallel between stars and and the angelic host. And we pick it up in the book of Revelation as well. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Mm. Now the north is where the throne of God is. So he will sit in the mount of the congregation. So there where the Godhood sits, he will sit. Yeah. He will be in the congregation. He will be in the bishop's seat, if you like. He will be the overseer. Yeah. He will be the one calling the shots. Mm -hmm. Do we have that kind of thing happening in the world today? Yes, and it's been there for millennia. And they're sitting in the, in the north. Mm -hmm. 
They sit on a great white throne, Martin, yes. with cherubs on either exactly. side. Mm -hmm. Do we have a power in the world that sits on a great white throne with cherubs around it, with four, four living, living beings yes. sitting around him? Mm -hmm. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. All right, we don't have to continue with that for the moment. Mm -hmm. We have laid some groundwork as to the character of the adversary. So let's go back to the beginning. Mm. And again, I, we, have to, we have to go here. I, I cannot <laughs> resist it. Let's go to the book of Revelation. And go to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we have the great controversy between the people of God and the people that belong to the devil. Mm. And it's the story about God's people, the woman, the church that flees from the wrath of the dragon. And the dragon is, of course, the great dragon, this terrible being. Verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, Martin, this is a very interesting story because this dragon, we are told, is the devil, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is defined as such. Yeah, the serpent. It is the serpent. It is the devil, that great deceiver. Mm. But he uses earthly powers, and in this case, the great red dragon was Rome. Mm. And it was the power that was used to try and destroy that child that, child mm. that would come, the Messiah. But then... We have a little bit of detail in, interconnected with it. He took a third of the stars. Mm. He wanted to rule over all of them. He ended up with a third. And they were cast out. And then we read in verse 7, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels. And we had a whole WhatsApp prof about who Michael was, so we're not going to go into that. Mm. Michael and his angels, the two-thirds, against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So there was a war in heaven. So there was a clash between these two concepts. And we've, we've laid some groundwork now. All right, let's go back to heaven mm -hmm. before this world was created. There was this majestic being and he coveted the throne of God. He wanted to sit in the congregation, but he wanted to sit on the throne of God mm -hmm. in the north. And he felt that it was his right and he was a covering cherub. He had a very good view of God's requirements and God's eternal wisdom and law. And yet he rebelled. Yeah. But by his insinuations, by his craft, it's interesting that we talk about a craft, uh -huh. right? <laughs> by his craft, he had convinced many angels mm. that his cause was just. So there was a controversy. And it was possible because he had freedom of choice. Yes. And he exercised that freedom of mm -hmm. choice. And therefore God allowed it to ferment to the point of open rebellion. Yeah. Because the angels that he was deceiving also had a free choice. And they had to make a decision. So they were looking like this. They were looking like this. And eventually it 
boiled over to the point of war, and eventually two-thirds sided with God, one-third sided with the devil, and he was cast out of heaven. And then God created this world. So this world was not an afterthought. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why did he create this world? Well, number one, Martin, the devil was cast out. He must have been cast out to somewhere. Mm. Right? Correct. So where was he cast out? Well, the Bible says that when God created this world, it was formless, and it was void, and darkness was over the waters. It was a dark place. Mm. A dark place is some, some place where God is not present, because God is light. Light, yeah. So is it that the darkness had been cast out to this place? And then God said, all right, let there be light in the midst of this darkness. Now, where there is light, God is present. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So God wasn't going to allow the darkness to continue forever. Mm. But now you have a serious situation. You have two sides in a controversy. You have God and his angels on the one side. And some of those angels are still confused. Yeah. Because obviously, for one third of the angels went... They all heard the arguments, and some of them were probably confused. So God could have nipped it in the bud, and he could have destroyed Satan and the rebellious ones, but then he would have had a government of fear for all eternity. Whoa! If we dare to think in the way that they thought then death is the consequence. Now, fear never conquers. Only love Con conquers. Correct. So, in other words, now there were two sides. Now, normally, if you have a serious dispute, let's say you and I have a serious dispute and it cannot be resolved amongst us. What do we normally do in an earthly situation? You get a third party. You get a third party to act as go-between yes. to sort out this issue. In other words, there needed to be a third party, an impartial third party. Was there an impartial third party in heaven? No. No. There were, only two si there were only two sides, mm. right? There was no impartial party. So what's the solution to this problem? You have to get one. Create one. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, if you had want an impartial third party in any court of law, when you go to a court of law, the two sides will state their case. All right? Mm -hmm. So there will be an advocate for the one side and an advocate for the other side. Now, in this particular case, the two parties had to state their case. But there was no one to state it before. Mm. So God, in his wisdom, created them. But if he had created them like the angels and taken them to the heavenly court and said, I want you to observe this, this would not have worked. It had to be an independent source. Mm. So he created them man and woman. And he shared something that he hadn't shared with anyone ever before, the capacity to bring forth offspring. Yeah. And then he gave them rulership. Mm. This has never been done before. Never. Yeah. He gave them rulership, dominion. dominion yeah. Now, the word rulership, rule, implies rules. <laughs> yes. Isn't that right? Correct. Because you cannot rule unless there are certain criteria mm -hmm. to rule by. And this was the unique 
aspect of humanity. Yes, because if you actually look at any organization or any movement, if it doesn't have rules set down, it's totally chaos in there. Yes. So the issue in heaven had to do with the rules. And the argument that Lucifer had is, I'm an exalted being. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have a set of rules to live by. I'm a rule unto myself. I will decide. Who are you to decide for me what is right and what is wrong? Mm. Because that must have been the case or else you couldn't have had a war. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. It's logical. Yeah. And so he thought to himself, these rules that I have been a covering cherub over, because he was the one that implemented God's rule, mm. right? He was the head of the angels. Yeah. I mean, God was over him, but he was the, the chief honcho, <laughs> right? And the angels adored him. Yes. And you find a little bit of that character in Absalom. Mm. The people adored him yeah. and went to him for judgment. Yeah. And he loved it to go and sit in the gate to be the judge and to judge the people and give them righteousness. And he said to everyone that came to him, that one's too, David's too busy. Mm. I will give you justice. So here was this majestic being displaying this kind of attitude. And so God threw him out mm -hmm. and created a jury. And he said, okay, here is the situation. There are two sides. There is my government, and you are created by me, and there are certain rules. And we'll make it simple. If you believe me and obey me, then you will not eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because I don't want you to know about evil. Mm. I want you to know only about good. But to be fair to the other side, at that tree there's an enemy that will tell you another side of the story. Mm. Now, just the, the way it unfolded. God saw them face to face because he created them on the end of the sixth day and the next day was the Sabbath day. Yeah. So for a whole day, they spoke to God mm -hmm. face to face. And God showed them their kingdom and God communed with them and there was nothing hidden. Mm. Nothing hidden. Nothing. And they had a full glimpse of the one side of the story. And then Eve wandered off to that tree and received the other side of the story. Mm. Did he really say that? Do you know what? It's not like he said. It's the other way around. You will surely not die. Yeah. And in fact, you know what? You've, you're just slaves. You're supposed to be obedient and not do this and not do that. Look at me. I can do whatever I want. I'll eat this fruit. Mm. But he comes as a serpent. He doesn't even come face to face. Mm. Is a serpent a being of, of uh, the description that we read in Isaiah? No. No. And when he said to Eve, the serpent, the first portion when he asked her, did God really say that? Yes. Then she actually added a little bit. Yes. And said, not no, touch. we don't even touch. Yeah. And then it was easier for him to say, but look, I touched and I can, Nothing I can even speak. Me. And so, like many of the angels, she believed him. Mm. And he mesmerized her. He hypnotized her into wanting something. You know, Martin, when we look at our television screens in the world, mm. do they constantly bombard you with what you, what you want? Oh, definitely. Definitely not with what you need, right? Because <laughs> we've got so much junk, we don't need it. Exactly. But uh, the want side. Yeah. So that's part of his character. That's for sure. But God permitted this, and he gave them rulership. 
Now, why did he give them rulership? This must have irked the devil. Yes. Now, modern rules and regulations and responsibility, that was God's intention mm. in creating this jury. And the devil had no insight yeah. as to how it was going to be created, this jury. He was furious, right? Because mm -hmm. there were a few things that must have really bugged him. Number one, the creating capacity of God was given to this new creation. Yeah. They could bring forth life. He couldn't do that. Mm. And they were given rulership, something which he coveted. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, why did God do that? Because in any situation where you have responsibility, mm. there you will need rules. You know, I always use this very simple example. If your child says it's going to play ball on the highway, then you will tell him that that is not permitted. And if he tells you he's a law unto himself and will decide for himself whether he can do that or not, then the board of education sometimes becomes a useful object, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So rules are sometimes enforced. Mm -hmm. Not because you hate your child, but because you love him. Love your child. So this was something that enabled them to make a decision as to whether God is just in having a set of rules and regulations or whether he is tyrannical. Mm. And this should help, right? Correct. Okay. But they lost their dominion. They ceded their dominion to this other power because the Bible tells you that if you obey someone, his servant you are. Yes. And so this being that had been thrown out of heaven became the representative in the councils of heaven of this earth. Yes. Incredible story. And God permitted it. Yeah. What does that tell you about the character of God? He is loving because he again permitted free choice. Is he fair? Definitely. He allowed this being to be in the council of God. And he said to him in the book of Job, what are you doing here? Yeah. And his arrogant answer walking up and down. Hmm. What does that say? Ownership. I am the Lord and the master of this place. I am the Lord and the master. And even in spite of the fall, not because of the fall, mm. because you can learn the lessons of rulership even without the fall. Yeah. Because if you had these children and you had to organize your dominion, then you would have had to work according to rules. And if you were a being of love, then those rules would have been a yoke of lightness. So even in this situation, God permitted it. But he had to show the universe what the consequences would be if you lived outside of the rules which God had established. Yes. All right? If I'm just thinking of it, when you say those the rules, I'm thinking of a hedge. Yes. And it's protecting what's inside. And that's the rules. And when you go out of those rules, over the hedge, then you're in the open field and all danger is upon you. Okay, that's a very good point. That's why the Bible uses the wall and the hedge as an example of that hedge that he planted around his people. Mm. So you find that image in the Bible where he says, I planted a vineyard, gave you a church, and I put a wall around you, yeah. which is the law. So actually, it's a very intriguing story. But now there was a greater catastrophe. Humanity had ceded its rulership mm -hmm. to this tyrannical power. And the consequence was death. 
The very first children murdered each other. Cain murdered Abel. And two camps evolved. And out of those two camps, there has been a situation of war since that day to the present. And you still have two camps. Yeah. And the evil side is unfortunately always in the majority and portrays itself as the benefactor mm. Mm. and makes rules and regulations because that is their right as rulers. Correct. They have become rulers of evil. Yes. But their rules are tyrannical. Contradictory to God's to rules. God's rule. And humanity is caught up in this situation. And they are the jury. They are the ones who are to decide either for the character of God mm. or for the character of the other. Multitudes, multitudes side with the adversary mm. in this great controversy. And you know, Martin, we showed them on the screen. And we showed the rock stars. Mm -hmm. And we showed how they give their power over to this being for the sake of what? That same thing that started in Lucifer. To be elevated. To be to elevated. Be higher, to, to be, be famous. Exactly. Isn't it interesting that when they achieve that status, mm -hmm. they are called stars? I don't think it's a coincidence. Oh, no, it's <laughs> definitely not a yeah. coincidence. And idols. <laughs> and idols, idolatry. It is, it is fascinating. And, and what are they boasting with? Themselves. And who gave them the capacity to sing? Who gave them the capacity to do all these things? God. Now, it's fascinating to me that some that can't even sing that croak like frogs, still can become stars if they give themselves over to this power. Yes. And some of them receive capacities beyond their human capacity and can play the guitar and admit that they can play that guitar better than they themselves can play it because another entity takes over. Mm. Isn't that correct? Yeah. All for the sake of what? Fame. For how long? So fleeting, right? Yeah. And the jury is out. The jury is looking. Now, Martin, this is a very different jury to normal juries. Normal juries sit there and very often they are even protected. All yep. right? But this jury becomes part of the, mm. the situation. This jury has to feel in its flesh the consequences of one choice over another choice. This jury has to witness how their own offspring mm. makes decisions either for glory or for calamity. And there is nothing they can do about it. Yeah. Nothing. You can chain your child yeah. to the wall, <laughs> but that will not gain the heart. So the only thing that, that will win the heart is freedom. You have to give freedom of choice. If you want to win the heart of someone, you have to give them freedom. You can never win someone's heart without giving them freedom. No, yeah, definitely not. How many relationships in this world are supposedly working because the one partner is caged? Mm -hmm. But no. open that cage and yeah. the bird will fly, fly away. How do you prevent the bird from flying? Giving it free choice. And giving it love. Exactly. It, it wants to stay there. 
Okay, now what about the prodigal son? Off he went. Yep. Give me my money, give yep. me everything, I'm out of here. Where did he end up? In the pigsty. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, and he came to his senses and he said, you know what, I'm going to make a choice here. It was better mm. in my father's house. Were there rules in his father's house? Yes. When he came back, did he say, whatever you say, I will do? Yes. Did he say that? Yep. So had he come to the conclusion that the rules that he rebelled against are better than the rules he ended up with? Definitely. I can take myself for on that. My dad used to say, you mustn't drink so much and go and party the whole time and then end up late at home and drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many times did I end up crashing the car or having to phone him to come and help me and stuff? And then he always used to say, you just push the limits too far. I, <laughs> I remember I once came home <laughs> and I had the key and I was looking for the keyhole. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't find it. And when I looked up, I was pushing the key into my father's navel. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very different jury. And the sad thing about this planet is that it is escalating the controversy as we come closer to this final point of destruction. Because we just read that this covering cherub and all that belong to him will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That's God's decree. Now, had he done that in the beginning, he would have had a government of fear. Yes. If he does this at the end, will it be fear or a sigh of relief? A sigh of relief. I think we're already there. Okay. All right. So this is the essence of the great controversy. A decision has to be made as to the character mm -hmm. of the two adversaries. Yes. And there are only two sides, Martin. Mm -hmm. There's, that's so important. Only two doesn't matter. So you can have a thousand organizations mm -hmm. and they can be seemingly at loggerheads. That's just a distraction. They all have one master yeah. or they have the other master. That's it. That is the choice that needs to be made. Even the ones that do not want to choose a side, unfortunately, will fall into one of the sides. There is no halfway measure. You cannot sit on the fence. Like Martin Luther said, you better choose one side. You either hide behind the devil or you hide behind Christ. Trying to make peace between the two means to be crushed. Compromise is impossible. Yes. I mean, how often do we read that compromise is impossible? It's impossible. So, the great controversy is all about a decision. And as the world moves towards a tyranny, mm -hmm. are we moving towards a tyranny? Definitely, we are moving towards tyranny. So do you feel more and more boxed in? <laughs> yes. Locked, Locked down? down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is Yeah. Oh, isn't that interesting? Is, it, is freedom of choice starting to disappear? Aha! The freedom of choice that we have in the world today is conditional. Uh, definitely. I just heard today that we in this country can now fly to 11 countries again. On condition. On condition. Let's not go there. Just to say on but condition. You, anything you do. Is on condition. On that, yes. You have free choice. On condition. <laughs> but if it doesn't fall into the condition, sorry, you know, free choice doesn't mean anything. <laughs> That's right. So common good, right? Mm -hmm. Common good. So the world has to make a choice. Now, once you've come to the conclusion that God's way is the only fair way, you actually have to not only choose between rules, 
you have to choose between the leader as well. Yes. Now, it's interesting to me that Roman Catholicism teaches ultramontanism, all power in one man. Mm. Because Martin, people say a camel is a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> and it might be good to have, you know, a committee to decide things, but very often it gets to the point that someone makes the decision. Correct. And this is where Rome comes in and says, this is the way it's going to be. Mm. So as I said, there is also a choice of leader mm -hmm. that is associated with this. And, and men love choosing leaders. Yes. Don't they? Oh, it's actually stunning yes. if you look at it. Yes. People are okay with it if the leader rules over or dictates over them for 40 years or 20 years, but they want that leader. They want that leader. Now, when Adolf Hitler came to power, he came to power because he promised the people many, many things. And he actually stepped up to the plate and fulfilled many of the promises, mm. right? Mm. After the First World War, the situation was dire, particularly in Germany, Correct. because the taxes and everything mm. that they had to pay and the retributions were so high. And the people were poverty struck. Mm. He restored many of those things. And they put their total trust on him. And what, what happened eventually? They, they called him Führer. Führer, yes, which is our leader. So here they were willing to do anything to go to war, to sacrifice themselves for a cause in eugenics. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And if you take Mao Zedong mm -hmm. or Lenin or any one of those yeah. despots, Genghis Khan, all of them. You always had, and, and Napoleon, you always have a leader, and then you have a conqueror. Correct. And if you take uh, American politics, mm. when they feel that someone is strong, they, they want to follow him. Mm. I mean, Trump had a tremendous following, right? He still does. He still does. So people want that. Mm -hmm. Now, Martin, is it important to you to know what the character of the leader is like? Yes. Now, when it comes to the great controversy and the character of God and the character of the other one, we've seen what the character is like that mm -hmm. was described. Now, when God went past Moses and he showed him his character, and uh, this God that is so kind and forgiving and all of these attributes. And he shone with a light so that you couldn't even look at his face, right? Mm. When this God condescended to come down to this earth and to bear the consequences for himself, and you look at the stories of the Gospels, have you ever, mm. anywhere, in any literature, come across the lead character. And the character of the lead character that even closely resembles the one of Jesus. No. Was he a strong individual? Yes, very strong. Very strong. Did he have strong principles? Definitely, yeah. Was he afraid to expose wrong no did he lord it over others no did he admonish his followers not to lord it over others yes yeah did he lead by example mm -hmm. did he love <laughs> to the point the of death time. right yes. so if you look at the cross the cross negates all the arguments i mean to think of it a lot of people then sees love as weakness love is strength mm -hmm. because they will say if 
For instance, I mean, his own disciples, they thought he was going to be king. And they maybe have thought of it a sign of weakness that he got crucified. Well, they actually did. Yeah. Yes. And Judas, to the point of betrayal, mm. he wanted to force his hand. Yeah. And that's important to know in our time. When a leader is there and wants to get rid of people or sort out all these things, that's not the character of God. No. No. So, Martin... Basically, the great controversy is about a decision. It is about a personal decision that everyone has to make individually. The facts in the great court case are open to everyone. You can switch on the media. You mm -hmm. can see the consequences of the great controversy. You have the greatest love story ever written right here explaining the great controversy. It shows the outplaying of the conflict to the point of death in the Gospels. It gives a portrayal of the character of God which many call weakness. Mm. So modern that which seems such a contradiction in terms mm. is actually where the strength of God lies. Yes. You know, if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, let's just go there, where... Paul is talking about the thorn in his flesh. Mm. And he says in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So lest he become like Lucifer Correct. wanted to be. Because he was so exalted. Mm. He had such an abundance of revelations. He knew more than anyone else. I mean, this is something that can make you lift it up, right? To prevent that, the Lord gave him a thorn in his flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. <laughs> So here we have a lesson in character development, yeah. right? So it is absolutely paramount that God give us lessons in humility, lest we develop a character like his adversary. <laughs> and he surely does do it. All right? So if you have a position of prominence, then expect some thorns. <laughs> yes. Right? And, uh, you know, when God, I always say when God gave us children, he gave us knees. Because without knees, you won't be able to survive. <laughs> I find this fascinating. And then it says in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, mm. that it might depart from me. Please take it away. Yeah. I'm perfectly capable, Lord of being fine without this thorn. And the Lord, knowing human nature, says, uh -uh. Uh -uh. Sorry, I think you need the thorn. Yeah. And I'm sure the first two times he was getting frustrated. And now the third time after he asked, he said, Then comes this verse, and it's written in red, the answer. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, Martin, do you think a president of a country would stand up and say that? No. Huh? <laughs> and nobody will say that of the president if right. he said this. He'll say, don't mess with me. I have an <laughs> army behind me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my strength is made perfect in my power and in the military might of my armaments. It's also interesting now that you mentioned it like that. All these leaders always have a big voice as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, Martin, this is the greatest contradiction that you can probably find anywhere. My grace is sufficient for thee, 
for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, Martin, were the disciples weaklings? Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and no. Yes, yes and, and no. no. Yeah. When were they weaklings? When it had to come to faith. When it came to faith. Yes. But before it came to that point, they were full of bravado. Exactly. Uh, they were puffed up. So that's why I say yes and no, because they weren't weak when it came to maybe physical, being physical, like Peter. But when it comes to being humble, they were weak. All right. Now, when did they become strong? After the crucifixion. After they realized their weakness, they became strong. Mm. Hmm? And that strength, if it's measured by humans, is actually weakness. Correct. So the great controversy often appears like a contradiction in terms. But the final analysis has to do with the character of the one in charge. And if you look at the world today, and you have to make this choice, it is to me so sad to see how few there are that are willing to take the burden of the yoke of lightness. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, that's well put. Just take a simple thing like the Sabbath. Mm. How much of an attitude and how much of a war is there against the simple command, remember the Sabbath day? It's astounding. Isn't that astounding? Yeah. Just, <laughs> just keep this day. It's, it's not a war. A war, right? Take any one of the commandments, idolatry, mm. or take the commandments of life. It's my body. Yeah. I'll decide what to do with it. Mm. Take uh, the laws of health. Don't tell me what to eat. Yeah. I will decide what to eat. Mm -hmm. Don't eat the blood. That's what makes it tasty. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah. I mean, the rebellion is yeah. all the way. And all the time, God is made out to be the tyrant. Correct. And this is it. God says, okay, you want to go against it? Go for it. Mm. The consequence is disease, sitting with arthritis, pain, suffering, tears at the grave, and yet we will not learn. Oh, you know, it's astounding to me. The devil started with this reversal, and we still sit with it. Because everything that God said, whether it be food, whether it be the Sabbath, is always turned around Correct. and made bad. And no, we've got the better choice. Woe to those who call evil good mm. and good evil. So let's sum it up, Martin. There was a war in heaven, and the war was about the government of God. Mm. The character of God as a ruler was on trial. You're not a benevolent God because you have rules. And if you make rules, who are you to enforce them upon me? That was it. Yeah. That same war enfolds or unfolds itself in every single household with children. Yeah. There comes a point when the children say, who made you ruler? Mm. I was sitting with my son and his four children and his wife. And uh, the wife gave a command to one of the children. <laughs> this little child put the hands in the side and said, who made you the boss? <laughs> and this great controversy just flashed before me. And uh, I, I had to smile. <laughs> That's Because that is the reality yeah. of it. This war has been raging ever since mm. the beginning. And very often, a parent has to let go and conquer with love. Because if you try to conquer and maintain through coercion, 
Do we have court cases in the world going on now where parents control certain people? We discussed it. We don't have to go into no, the details. I actually think, if I remember correct, she lost the case. Correct. So, so you cannot control someone by no. coercion. Yes. You can only win this battle with love. Mm -hmm. And if I had to look at the two sides and the characters of the two sides, and I see how the world stage is portraying those characters, then I have come to the conclusion that I will serve the master that was prepared to die for my freedom of choice. And if the world will decide that, everybody who makes that decision and who accepts that free choice, that free gift of eternal life, will be safe to have around in heaven. No coercion, no puffed up individual who yeah. thinks he's the bee's knees. Regard for the neighbor. Yeah. Selfless love. <laughs> Selfless love. That's the kind of environment that you will choose. And God will have the right to destroy this world. And even if there are tears, he will wipe them off. Mm. And then the lion and the lamb will lie next to each other. And they will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain in his kingdom. And that will be the end of the great controversy when that fire comes down from heaven and the enemies are destroyed. Ashes. Come and sit at my side, at my right side, till I make your enemies your footstool. And you know, that obliteration of enemies doesn't bring joy to God. No. It is, the Bible calls it his strange act. Yeah. But the whole universe will say, fair and just mm -hmm. are your judgments. Amen. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we are all a part of this great controversy. There are no spectators, only participants. And we can all feel a fraction of the pain. You have felt it for millennia from the foundations of the world. And we have felt it for a short period which is called this life. But the final issue is a choice. The jury has to sit, the jury of the mind, and decide for the party of their choice. Help us to make right choices. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe to our channel, click here. To get notifications, click on the bell. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you and we'll see you again.